could you please give me a greeting? Just uh, in my chat box, just give me a quick greeting so I know that you can hear me, please. Hold on a sec. Let's see if I can open this chat box. Great. Okay. So, Joanna Avram Rod in LA, w- a wide awake on a early on a Sunday. Jenny, Batya, Benjamin. Okay, forgive me if I don't greet everybody. Alan, nice to see you, I presume, from Edgware. Um, Howard. Okay. Rats. Greetings to everyone. Forgive me if I don't greet you personally. That's only because um, because I can't greet everybody. But uh, thank you very much to Gemma at the JLE, who's making this happen. Thank you to JLE itself. And to all of you VIPs, very interested persons who are joining for this series or part of the series on actions of the soul. So just to give you a little bit of background and uh, practicalities, we have um, this two series. One is on Monday nights, which we just began, which is on mitzvahs, actions of the soul. And Wednesday nights, when we're talking about the big ideas, thoughts of the soul, if you like. The fundamental philosophical or spiritual ideas in Judaism that are necessary for understanding Torah in general. So, we began the first session (coughs) in this series last week (coughs) with an introduction. We said we're going to model this on a classic work called the Derech Mitzvotecha, Derech Mitzvotecha, which is by the Tzemav Tzedek, the third Rebbe in the line of Chabad, a classic, absolutely classic work, which is unique in that (coughs) what it does is (coughs) <coughs> goes through mitzvahs, explaining the spiritual background, and in most cases, very deep Kabbalistic background, of the mitzvah, so that the practical, or let's say, the, the specific output you get when you learn through this particular work, not only do you end up knowing <coughs> what the mitzvah is, but you end up understanding why the mitzvah needs to look that way. As I explained last week, if you do a mitzvah without knowing this, you are simply doing things because that's what you're supposed to do. You take a lulav, it has this detail, it has that detail. Why? Torah says so. But once you learn through Derech Mitzvah at least the, the, the few dozen mitzvahs that he talks about, you begin to understand what lies behind the mitzvah, and most particularly and fascinatingly, why every detail of the mitzvah needs to be the way it is. <coughs> when we count the Omer, which is what we hope to speak about this evening, <coughs> or today, you are beginning to understand why the mitzvah takes that particular form. And of course, it's a whole different world when you are able to perform a mitzvah and connect with Hashem, don't forget the word mitzvah means connection, over and above the concept of a commandment, <coughs> it is a totally different world. So that was the introduction that Tzemach Tzedek, the Derech Mitzvah Serkan, a mitzvah is an absolute classic, begins with the mitzvah of having children, what that means spiritually, and um, has a unique subsection on emunah, the mitzvah of faith and trust, he, does, he discusses also the, the commandment of counting the Omer, and I'd like to discuss a little bit as the first in our series that deals with the practical mitzvah, a specific mitzvah rather. I'd like to try to talk a bit about that. I can't go through what he says in detail. It's very, very Kabbalistic, extremely Kabbalistic. I try to refer a little bit to what he says, but what I'm going to try to do is give a background on just one facet of theme that he brings out in, <coughs> in his discussion calling on other sources as well, and I hope you'll get a feel for, for this particular process of counting the days between Pesach and Shavuot that you that you never had before. <coughs> so, <coughs> I hope that's okay with you. <coughs> Let's make a start and try to get a little bit deeper <coughs> in terms of this mitzvah. You're welcome to ask a question. I can't see or hear you, but if you type on my in my chat box, I will do my best. Try, please, to ask a question that is 100% relevant to what's being discussed only. And please give me a chance to build a picture before you start asking questions. Try to understand from a new perspective <coughs> before we uh, <coughs> before asking questions. If I don't answer your question, please forgive me. Either I didn't notice it, it, f- it flew by too fast on my screen, or I was not able to do it. Which derech you refer to? Derech mitzvoy secha. Let me show you the new edition. <coughs> I showed it last week. Derech mitzvoy secha. Very beautifully produced. Three volume work. There are, there are many editions of this, but this is the recent one. Has very, very good explanations and notes and very careful <coughs> introductions and summaries. So, 
This is a classic from the world of Hasidus, something, an area of Torah we haven't really discussed before. So, let's talk about the counting of the Omer. Last week, we spoke about mitzvahs. The main thing we tried to lay down last week was that Torah and mitzvah <coughs> are male and female. <coughs> the male begins the process of birth, the female carries it through to its fulfillment. The male longs to be expressed in the female. The Torah longs to be expressed in mitzvahs. Right? Torah and mitzvah, the ultimate male-female combination. Right? The source dimension, just like Hashem is the source dimension, and then the world is female, which gives expression <coughs> to what is. One of the issues I did not mention last week, <coughs> worth just touching on before we discuss the Omer specifically, is that one example of this duality is mind and body, or body and soul, if you like. <coughs> the soul dimension compared to the body is male, and the body compared to the soul is female. The neshama, the spiritual realm, spiritual. The body, the material realm, material. Right? The two, always like all male-female partnerships, can only exist in harmony. One without the other cannot be expressed. A soul without a body just floats around in the spiritual world. A body without a soul is just dead, dead tissue. <clears throat> as soon as the two come together, the electric tension between the two of them, or should I say the love that is established between male and female, the dynamic of the interaction, <clears throat> the electricity set up between their opposite natures is where life is. <clears throat> Therefore, Torah and mitzvah is a male-female marital combination, just like body and soul. The soul is the, is, the, is the root aspect, the spiritual meaning, but cannot be seen, no expression, unless there's a body to express it. <clears throat> right? So, that is the duality, Torah and mitzvah, mind and, mind and body, if you like, that combination. Let's apply that to the mitzvah of counting the Omer. So counting the Omer, as you know, begins on the second day of Pesach. Let's just state what it is, <coughs> and then we'll try to, to analyze it from a deeper perspective. Counting the Omer, 49 days that we count <coughs> from Passover to Shavuot, whatever the English name is for Shavuot, Pentecost, I think it is. Pesach to Shavuot, we count from the second day of Pesach, the day on which the <coughs> Korban or Omer is brought, <coughs> the sacrifice of Bali, the bushel, if you like, or the basket, or the, the statutory amount of the, of the barley harvest, which is harvested for the first time in the year on the second day of Pesach. From the moment of that, the day of that offering, we are counting 49 days to arrive at the 50th day, which is Shavuot. And Shavuot itself is the 50th day, the day of the receiving of the Torah. <clears throat> the mitzvah is to sacrifice the Omer, barley, and count the days until you get to Shavuot. It should be obvious to anyone who thinks about this that there are two food offerings. The first is barley on the second day of Pesach, and the second, 49 days later, on <coughs> the 50th day, is the two highly refined <coughs> baked <coughs> breads, the, the Shteh Alechem, the two breads that are offered 13 times sifted pure flour, which is complete opposite to the barley. The barley is coarse, coarse animal food, Sa'ora, as it's called, Sa'ora, and the... Um, the fine, refined, refined flour that no one gives to animals, only human delicacy, that is what's offered on the 50th day. So this is a progression from a barley offering to a fine flour offering. That is the progression. We need to understand that. By the way, that Semach Serek, just to give you a flavor for the Kabbalistic insight, the Hasidus, he says that, oh, this will take a long time to explain, but just to refer to it, at least Se'ora, Se'oira is the barley, which is brought on the second day of Pesach, and as he explains, it is Shi'ur Hashem. Se'ora, Shi'ur Hashem. The measurement of Hashem. <coughs> right, a sensitive ear begins to hear <coughs> that the barley begins the process of measurement. Measuring the days, one, and two, and three. Right, and he goes on to explain what is meant by this Shi'ur of Hashem, this finite dimension, so to speak, the measured dimension that Hashem manifests in, which is being expressed during the Omer. Um, he also explains... Semach Tzedek explains that, <coughs> that what you are doing here <coughs> is taking the material world, <coughs> which in the human dimension is called the blood, <coughs> right, that's called dam. <coughs> the dam is the blood, as it's well known, the, the word Adam is Aleph and dam. Aleph is the spiritual dimension, dam is the blood, which is the earthy dimension, dam, dam hua nefesh. The blood is the, is the nefesh aspect, the lower aspect of the soul, the soul that connects with the body. That is the dam aspect. The Aleph is the spiritual aspect. When the two come together, you have Adam. And as, it's, as the, as the Derech Mitzvah Secha points out, Dam is 44. Dam is 44. 
There are 44 days from the end of, from the seventh day of Pesach until Shavuot. Pesach is a whole different dimension on its own. When you get beyond Pesach, the days of counting outside of Pesach, days that are only counting towards Shavuot, those are 44 days. And what happens when you get to the 44th day, you then enter another dimension in which the spiritual Aleph is put in, and then the Adam is constructed. But what he's referring to is the progression from the animal to the human, <coughs> from Bahama <coughs> to, <coughs> to Adam. I'm sure all you black belt Kabbalists will, will know very well that the Dan plus the Aleph is 45, and that's exactly the same as the number of Bahama. Of Bahama. Bahama is a 45 that contains itself entirely. Anyway, we'll try to explain some of these ideas if we can. <coughs> but let's ask some <coughs> questions about the Omer. <coughs> I uh, highly recommend those of you whose Hebrew is good enough. You learn through, especially if a little Kabbalistic background or familiarity with some of the ideas of Hasidus. You look in the Rech Mitzvah and while we're going through the Omer, <coughs> try to study <coughs> a little bit of the depth behind what he says. Don't be dismayed if you find it difficult. It is written for people with with background, it's really very, very deep Kabbalistic <coughs> um, uh, material. Let's ask a few questions about counting the Omer and see if we can bring out what a little bit, <coughs> what lies a bit beneath the surface. After all, we're trying to look from the body to the soul. And we do that by examining the body. <coughs> Let's stop here for a moment. How do you get to know the soul? After all, in a human, the human realm, we are more interested in the soul than the body. We're more interested, of course, the body is essential can't express a soul in the world without a body. We're just as interested in the body as we are in the soul, in the overall pattern. We're just as interested in the female as we are of the male. But we try to drive back here to the source. right? How do you get back to the source? Or to put it in its broadest form, how do you get to know God in the world? How do you get to know Hashem in the world? I would like to suggest to you that the Omer is the way to do it. And I'll try to explain this <coughs> if, I, if I can. If I can. <coughs> The Omer, the Omer, what's the gematria of Omer? Somebody no, do a little exercise. What's the gematria of Omer? No, somebody tell me, please. Do a little calculation. 310, exactly. 310 in Hebrew is Yesh. <coughs> the Omer is the same word as Yesh. Yesh in Hebrew means is of intrinsic existence. Yesh means totally exists. The reverse of the word Yesh, by the way, is Shai. Shai means an ultimate gift, an ultimate gift. But yesh means that which exists. The Hanchil Oyhava Yesh. Hashem says, to give those who love me, yesh. What will be your reward in the next world? It will be a dimension called yesh. Real existence. Real intrinsic existence, right? 310. Why 310 is the particular number? <coughs> Perhaps that... <coughs> Perhaps that we can discuss another time. <coughs> what does 310 suggest to you? Just a immediate intuitive reaction. What does 310 suggest? What does it bring to mind? Well, what it should bring to mind, yes, beautiful Eli Natan, beautiful, thank you, yes, that's what I expect from my black belts. Very good, indeed. Half of 620, yes, 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 indeed, half of 620. That's very significant, isn't it? 310, half of 620, now you know that the mitzvahs are 620. Right, the mitzvahs, the 613 mitzvahs as we know them, seven non-Jewish mitzvahs, <coughs> or seven rabbinic mitzvahs, <coughs> 620, what the Kabbalists call <coughs> the 620 columns of light that the world is constructed on, right? The Tarach Amudei Or, 620 columns of light. I'm sure I don't have to remind you that there are 620 letters in the Ten Commandments. <coughs> the root dimension, the crown dimension of Torah. <coughs> so when, <coughs> when Hashem gives a reward to the righteous... <coughs> in the world to come. Why is it only 310? Should it not surely be 620? I did not call the Noahide laws rabbinic, Alex. Listen, you have to listen, listen well. I said there are two calculations of 620. 613 plus the Noahide laws, or alternatively 613 plus the rabbinic mitzvahs. Right? There are two different ways to calculate. <coughs> the 600, either way, there's 620 root, root lights in the tree, as the Kabbalists explain. So, if Hashem is going to give you those who, those whom He loves, or those who love Him, those who love Him, in the world to come, He will give real, intrinsic, independent existence, like His existence, which is called Yesh. Why is it only 310? Why is it only 310? Why does each individual get 310? Well, I'll give you five seconds to answer. <coughs> the clue has been given. The clue has been given. 
Well, one of the answers to that question is because each fulfilled individual, indeed, well said, well said, yes, now I'm getting some thinkers, because, yes, yes, all correct, all quite correct, but I think the root way to say it is because you are half of a married pair. Your soul is half of a male-female combination which was fused in the spiritual world and brought down to this world <coughs> to be fulfilled by another half, and therefore the... Um, and therefore, the 310 worlds, which are the gift to every righteous individual, of course, that individual is only half of a spiritual being until reunited with the other half, the male and the female together, and that's the 620. Why 620? <laughs> that's another subject. The Ramchal says, of course, it should have been a 1,000. But there are only 620 of the 1,000 that need correction. The others are too high. But again, that's another subject. But that's Omer. Omer is the Yesh. So we're counting from a inchoate non-existence or a beginning that is unreal in some sense at Pesach to an existence that is real at Shavuos when we mesh with Torah and our souls bond with Hashem that He kiss us with the kisses of His mouth as it says. What is this progression? <coughs> what is this progression? From the animal to the human from the artificial to the real from the vulgar coarse food that is animal food of the of the Sora which is the shear of Hashem the finite measured dimension so to speak, of God's world, to the transcendental, infinite dimension of Shavuos, which is the refined food. Actually, in some, the Semach Tzedek brings the idea that the, the, the vulgar food, or the coarse food, is also the angelic food. Amazing. It's what the angels eat. We are higher than the angels. We progress from the angelic to the human. Amazing. We progress from the animal to the human during the counting of Omer. We progress from the angelic to the human, which is far, far higher far, far higher. <coughs> okay, that was a little bit of rambling. If you hope you'll excuse me, just by way of introduction. Let's ask some questions about the Omer. Let us ask some questions about the Omer and um, see if we can use them <coughs> to build a, a, a method of getting to the soul from the body. The principle we're using is called Mipsari Echze Eloka, something that Tzemach Tzedek uses and all sources in Hasidus use and that is the principle that you can see God from your flesh. Mipsari From my flesh I see God. That's remarkable. We're not saying from myself I see God, but from my flesh. Flesh is a very low thing when we talk about Mipsari From my flesh. Flesh, the word basar in Hebrew means meat. That's a very low way to refer to a human being. You're talking about the ultimate material level of human existence. And yet it's from that level that you can see God. The basic idea is that when you wish to make contact with the soul, of someone you love, <coughs> a dear friend, for example, there's no way to make contact with that soul except through the body. When you want to draw the person close to you, how do you do that? You have to embrace the body. With all its with all its fallen side, containing excrement, given to disintegration, all the finite limitations of a body. Nevertheless, it's a vessel for the soul. And the only way you ever see the soul is through the body. There's no other way to do it. Right? When you wish to, if you want a very, a very in, in, inadequate modern analogy, the only way you get into the software or into the computer is through the screen. The screen is only an input-output device. That's all it is, but it's essential. The body is an input-output device. It operates in the material world. It speaks to you. You can speak to it. But it's through the body that you see the spiritual, see the divine. When you relate to your friend, how do you know what mood they're in? How do you know their mood? How do you know their thoughts and their inner being? Only through the expressions of their face and the gestures and the nuances of their voice, which is all material. But it's from that material interface that you get to know the person. It's the only avenue of access. The only avenue of access to the spiritual world is the parts of the material world. And therefore, when you want to know Hashem, you have to approach Him through the manifestation of the material world. You get to know Hashem. There's no other way to do it. You can't leap out of this world. You can't do that. You have to carefully observe this world, no matter how distant it is. When you see an image projected on a screen, <coughs> some moving image on a screen, <coughs> how unreal is that? It's only a flickering image on a screen. And if you go back and look for the source of projection, it's some software or it's a film through which light is being shone. And even that's unreal. That is a photograph of another time and place. And if you go back to that time and place, it might even be people pretending to be other people. And yet it's good enough. If you watch that movie carefully, you watch those faces and you watch those places, one day when you 
make contact with them, when you meet them in real, for real, you go to that place, you'll recognize it. Through this very few dimensions, distant reality of a projection, you can learn the reality. Right? That's how you look at Torah, by the way. The, the shapes and forms of the letters in Torah. Very specific, limited, finite reality. Through that you see Hashem. It's the only chance you have. And this is what the sphere is here to teach us. So let's see if we can fathom it. Let's look into the material aspects, the material, the manifest aspects of the mitzvah. Let's study the details of the mitzvah and see if we can plumb the soul, at least to some extent. The mitzvah, as you know, is counting of days and weeks. We begin on the second day of Pesach. We count 49 days. We, begin it, we do it at the beginning of the day, namely the evening, the night, as the day begins. We count each day. We summate the weeks as well, which is another discussion why we need to count the days and the weeks. We arrive at the day, at the 49th day, and that introduces the 50th, which is Shavuot. The mitzvah is to count. We make a blessing. And then we enumerate the day. That's what we do. Let's ask a few questions about this mitzvah, which I hope will serve to open up the subject. The first question, I think, and the most basic, perhaps, is what does one hope to achieve by counting? Very strange. A mitzvah is an action in the material world, which, so to speak, turns a handle, which moves a mechanism in the spiritual world. What is being moved here? What is to be achieved by simply the counting? It's not the waiting. It's counting. Each day. Not simply waiting for 49 days to go by. You're counting the days. And it's very much a counting. You know, each day is added to the count. Here's one, one observation that Semach Tzedek makes, which is worth many hours of pondering. He says, the way we count the days, we don't say, Hayom yom Sheni, right, Basfira. We don't say, this is the second day of the Omer. We say, we say today is two days of the Omer. Hayom Shnei Yomim Ba'omer. These are, today's two days of the Omer. That's interesting. We don't say that. When we count towards Shabbos, for example. So we say, Yom Rishon B'Shabbos, Sheni B'Shabbos, the first day of Shabbat, the second day of Shabbat, we count seven days that way. When we count the Omer, we say this is we say this is one day of the Omer, two days of the Omer. What do we mean? What do you mean by saying it's two days of the Omer? Why are we not saying it's the second day of the Omer? The third day of the Omer. Right? Please, please hold the questions and the comments if you don't mind. Just give me a little time to build a theme and then I'll be very happy to take your your questions if if you have any. That's the first clue as to what's going on here and he brings out that point. Let's ask a few more questions. Why do we not count the first day? We begin on the second day of Pesach. The, the, the offering of the Omer is on the second day of Pesach. That's interesting. This is very clearly a count from Pesach to Shuas. Very clearly. It links the two. Pesach is the beginning. That's called the birth of the Jewish people. Our conception was in Egypt and our birth was in <coughs> was the, in the ex, at the Exodus. <coughs> Actually, the process of birth began at the Exodus. <coughs> the water splitting, like a woman's water is breaking in birth, was the splitting of the ocean. And that's where we were born, born fully. And then there's a process of growth until Shuas, when we mature enough to be given the Torah. So the process of counting from Pesach to Shuas is from Pesach to Shuas. Why do we not count from the first day of Pesach? Why do we only count from the second day? Question one. Next question. Why don't we count the last day? That's even more perplexing. We don't count the 50th day. We count 49 days. And that's very strange. We're counting all the way through. We're counting all the way through to Shuas. And yet, we don't count the day of Shuas itself. What's even more strange is the Torah tells us to. The Torah says, Tis hamishim yoim, Count 50 days. The Torah says clearly, Count 50 days. 49 is not 50. <clears throat> How do we fulfill the Torah's mitzvah of counting 50 <clears throat> by, in, by in fact only counting 49? We take the Torah very, very seriously. Very seriously. Every nuance in Torah is meaningful to us. If the Torah says count 50 days, how can we count 49 days? On the night of Shuas, when you stand up and make Kiddush, right? You sit down and make Kiddush, whatever your custom is. We should say, tonight is the 50th night, just like we do on every other night. The Torah says clearly, count 50 days. If count, 40, if count 50 days means you count each day, why? what's the problem with the 50th day? Why, why don't we count it? Yeah, we don't. We don't count the 50th. We count 49 days. And the 50th... By the way, there are other examples of this in Torah which follow the same theme. Somewhat related is the fact that the Torah says that certain punishments, certain sins need 49 lashes. Right? 
uh, excuse me, 39, 40 lashes, and the rabbis rule that it's 39. Right? Arba'im yakeno, you shall lash him 40 times, and the rabbis have the power to make it 39. You can't play fast and loose with the commands of the Torah. If the Torah says 40, how do we get away with 39? Of course there's incredible rabbinic power. Of course. But the Torah has to be true. That's a related question. So question one is, why do we count the days of the Omer as days piling up? We don't count them in sequence. We don't say the second and the third. We say two days of the Omer, three days of the Omer. Second question, why don't we count the first day? <coughs> we start on the second. Third question, why don't we count the last day? Next question. Of course, this is all on the basic question of what we hope to achieve by accounting. Next question. Why do we count forwards and not backwards? Let me explain this question. All of our understanding of, of the counting of the Omer is that it's an it's a enthusiastic and ecstatic, loving preparation for the marriage of Shavuot. Shavuot is the time when Hashem, so to speak, marries the Jewish people. Many, many facets of that. He should kiss us with the kisses of His mouth, which means an intimate meeting. The mountain is held over us like a chuppah. The Torah is given to us like the ring. It's a, it's a, but Yom, it, it, Yom Chasunosei, <coughs> right, is the way King Solomon expresses it, the day of his wedding, the day of our wedding. There's no question that this is anticipation of a total bond. As you know, the Gemara says that when the Torah was given at Sinai, when the first of the commandments was spoken, the Jewish people died. Died means then the Shamas flew out in unity to, with Hashem. The bodies were knocked back in one direction, the souls flew out in the positive direction. Then he spoke again, they were revived, they died again when they heard him speak the second time, and they opted not to hear more directly from him, because it's not simple to go through death. But, but that was a, that, there's no intimate meeting like that, right? You know that the death at the ultimate stage is called a Mrs. Nashika. It's a death that is a kiss. And therefore, and therefore, there's no question that the longing, the process of counting, is a process of counting, from Pesach to Shavuos, it's an anticipation. <coughs> anticipation. <coughs> it's all, also anticipation of our own greatness. As I tried to explain before, Pesach is an animalistic. Animal means, <coughs> when I say animal, it means the human born, <coughs> so to speak, like an animal. No self-development. Pesach was, there was no self-development in Pesach. It was given to us for free. Hashem took us out, so to speak, virtually for free. <coughs> right? Virtually no mitzvahs. Virtually no merits. Lifted up to the 50th level for free, so to speak. The 49 days in the desert is an acquisition process. <clears throat> it's, a, it's, a, it's a work to make, it, to make it real. And so there's an anticipation of the human that we will become. <clears throat> we begin with the sacrifice of animal food, <coughs> the very lowest level of the human being, completely undeveloped, and we reach a culmination of a human level, where the sacrifice of Shavuos is ultra-refined, which is human. So there's a longing here, a, a, a maturity, a process of maturity, from the undeveloped, child, childish, infantile level, as it's referred to in Kabbalistic sources, to the adult level of the Meichen, where, the, where the, the, the brain comes in, there's that process of, devel- of anticipation, and the ultimate anticipation, <coughs> of being at a level of maturity enough to meet Hashem personally, face to face. Now, whenever you count towards a long for event, you count down, not up. You never count up, you always count, can you remember, a person, a person let's take the example of marriage, a person is moving towards marriage, they count the days that are left, count the days that have gone by, they're completely irrelevant. Days gone by since when? Don't do that. You count, imagine a person is about to get married in three months' time. <clears throat> what are they counting? How many days have gone by since they were born? No, there has to be something strange about if you do that. You count how many days are left. There's 45 days left and 44 days left. Right? A person in jail who's looking forward to his release in a certain number of days, does he count the days that have gone by? That's too awful to think about. He counts the days that are left with great anticipation. Right? When you're looking to an event that's happening, you count down. They're about to blast off for the moon. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six. You count down to blast off. Can you remember when you came close to the end of your school career? Can you remember where there were only a few weeks left till the end of your school career? What were you counting? You didn't count the number of days you'd spent in school. That would be much too depressing. You counted the number of days that were left. You counted them down. It's a countdown. And therefore, surely, the countdown to Shavuos should be a countdown. Why do we count up? <coughs> Why are we counting the days that have gone by? So to speak, piling up the days and noting the number of days that have gone by. Why is that relevant? We're not looking behind us. We're looking forward. 
In case you think I'm making too much of this point, in case you think that I'm making too much of this point, you know what we call the counting? <coughs> we call it the counting of the Omer. The counting of the Omer, which means the counting of the process where it begins. The Omer is the, is the Omer of barley. It is the amount of barley that is, that is uh, cut down and brought as an offering on the second day of Pesach. We are counting from the point of origin. We call it, indeed, indeed, Alex, that's a very deep point, when a woman counts her seven days before going to the mikveh. She counts them in the same way, indeed. And there's a very close connection between the count of a woman preparing for her purity and meeting with her husband in seven days and the seven times seven. Well, in fact, now that you've raised the point, <coughs> there are those halachic authorities who require a woman to count as well. Not just to wait, again, the main, the main function of the seven, purity, seven days of purity before mikveh. A woman could be a man as well when men have to go to mikveh. In Torah times, for certain types of impurity, there are seven days of counting. And the main point, of course, is that seven days should pass. And yet there are authorities, there are halachic authorities, who feel that a person should actually count the days. Exactly. Exactly. And what I say now will apply to that as well. But we're not dealing with it in the context of the Nira laws at the moment. We're dealing it in the context of the context of the mitzvah of the Omer. And so, and so, the counting of the Omer is a counting up instead of counting down. First of all, we count up, and second, we name it for the point of departure. And that is extremely strange. Nobody on a journey names his journey for the point of departure. That's just meaningless. If you're taking a train from London to Paris, it's the Paris train. You don't call it the London train. <coughs> You'd have to be bizarre to do that. <coughs> right? Anyone on a journey, the fixation of a journey is on the point of destination. The only meaning of the point of departure is you have to leave. You have to know where to get the train. So it's important that you know what the point of departure is. But that's not how you name the journey. You name it for tachlis, for purpose, for end goal. <coughs> so how can we name <coughs> the process of the Omer for the point of departure? And we look back, so to speak, over our shoulder. We left from the Omer, we, uh, one day beyond that, we two days beyond that. This is a complete reversal of the ideal of what the counting of the Omer means. Okay, we could ask many other questions as well. <coughs> we, are counting, we are counting the days, and there are many other questions we could ask as well. Let me try to suggest an answer to you, which I hope you'll find illuminating, and give meaning to all of these questions. Is that okay? Can I, can I proceed? If we are so far together, please give me a quick yes. Not easy to speak to an audience you can't see. I've no idea if anyone's out there, if anyone's awake out there. So let me have a quick yes so I know that there's something who, someone who is listening. Okay, good, 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 good. Thank you very much. Let me suggest to you an answer which I hope you'll find more than illuminating. Let me try to express it and explain it as clearly as I can. The world consists of measured parts. As the Tzemach Tzedek teaches us, Shi'ur Hashem, the measurement of Hashem. It's a finite world. It's a world made up of quanta, as you know from your study of physics, I'm sure. Quanta, finite amounts. The world is put together in terms of units, units of count. can be expressed in terms of units of chemistry or units of mathematics. The world is a finite place, totally bounded, bounded in all senses by the laws of chemistry and physics and cosmology, by the laws of mathematics in particular, run through all of science and all of physics. How do you reach transcendence? How do you, how do you leap beyond this world? How do you feel the spiritual? How do you experience the spiritual? How do you leap into the non-bounded dimension? How do you get to know God? And the answer is only through the world. Only through the world. Only through the finite steps. And here's the secret. Let me try to express the secret as plainly as I can and then try to feel it out in some of its applications. When you put finite parts together, when you build what we call a klal, a klal which means a, a set or a group, you construct something which goes beyond the sum of the parts. The secret is when parts are put together correctly, something happens that is more than the sum of the parts. 
There's no way to do that directly. You can only do it through the parts. Let me try to give a few examples to fill this out. This is critically important. Critically. There's no other way to be spiritual. There's no other way to get beyond. There's no other way to be, begin to get a feeling of what God is, or what your own soul is, or what your potential is, or a relationship with Hashem could be, other than this. And therefore it pays, it pays to understand this well. Let me give you a few examples to feel the concept. Let's take music. I choose that because music, one of the conventional scales that we use, perhaps the most conventional scale in Western music is the seven-note scale. Right, the seven-note scale. We call it octave, of course, because the eighth is back to the first and a repetition again. And the counting of the Omer is a seven-note cycle, if you like. I'm sure you know that the seven is the basic number of all material manifestation. Seven notes in the musical scale that we use with very specific mathematical relationships between the frequencies that form the sounds of the scale. The same mathematical relationship, by the way, as the wavelengths of light that make the seven colors in the spectrum. <coughs> nice accident. The seven colors in the spectrum. By the way, the three main notes in the seven-note scale, right? You know, there are three primary notes, the tonic, the dominant, and the subdominant in a seven-note scale. There are three primary colors in the spectrum of light as well. The rest, are, the rest are combinations and constructions. Very interesting. Very interesting for an accidental world. And of course you know that seven is the root number of all that is significant in the world. Seven great biblical characters. Seven days of the week, of course. The world is created in that way. Seven fruits of Israel. The barley and the wheat being two of them. The uh, seven points of the constructed world, right? Left, right front, back, up, down, those are your six bounds, and the seventh, which is the unifying point that brings them all together, which is called Shabbos. The Shabbat is the unifying element in which the week finds its tachlis. In English, we're used to calling it the three-dimensional world, but in Kabbalistic terminology, <coughs> we call it a six-sided world. Three dimensions, but each one, of course, has a polarity. There's left, right, front, back, up, down, the facets of the cube, the six aspects of the cube in a stylized representation of a three-dimensional world, and the fact that the cube is constructed is unity, or the Kabbalists call it the center point, right, where the cube, six pieces of material floating around in space are not a cube. When the six come together, you have a cube. You can't put your finger on that. You can't extract it. You can't take the seventh one out, but I can show you when it's there. But let's talk about music. There's so many examples to talk about, and the only way to do this, of course, is to get a feel for the examples, to extract the principle. But let's talk, let's talk about music. What happens w when you experience music? Again, I'm only talking to people who have a sense for music. If you feel, if you, if you are deaf to music, this will not speak to you at all. But if you've ever enjoyed <coughs> being moved by a piece of music, you will know. By the way, music transcends its composers. Music transcends. People often ask, are you allowed to listen to music written by degenerate individuals or virulently anti-Semitic individuals? Absolutely. Music is not Makabal Tumah, as Ramosha Shapiro used to say. Music is not Makabal Tumah. He used to say, you can see it comes from a higher place. It's channeled through the individual, through the musician, through the composer. But it clearly comes from a different place. So what is a piece of music? When you analyze it, it's very peculiar. Music is simply a series of meaningless sounds. A plink, and a plonk, and a plonk, and a plink. If you play the sounds individually, it's not music. It doesn't do anything to you. But if you, um, if you are, uh, if you are playing music correctly and you put those notes together correctly, Aaron, you'll excuse me if I don't read your note at the moment. I just need to build this theme. When you play a piece of music, when you put the plinks and plonks together correctly, something happens called music. It is greater than the sum of the parts. And not only is it greater. That's the point. The amazing thing about music is, forgive me if I labor this point a little bit, the amazing thing about music is that it is nothing other than a series of notes, nothing else, and yet something far greater. But the mysterious thing about it is, the important part of the music is the transcendent element. <coughs> the important part <coughs> is not the notes. <coughs> it's the totality of the effect <coughs> that the notes have when they're put together. <coughs> yes, you can only do them by playing the notes. And a great musician plays the notes perfectly. Perfectly. Each nuance, each grace note, 
Each note is played perfectly. Perfectly. Each note is critical. And yet what happens is, when the music comes together, the notes are not the point. This is something absolutely amazing. Of course, it only takes a moment to realize it's much easier to put the notes together wrong than right. <laughs> the world is much easier to break down than to build. No question about that. That's the downside of a finite world that is Shi'ur Hashem, made up of the measures, the measurements. Eitan, of course, that's why we move the Lulav in those directions. Of course we do. Move the Lulav in the six directions. Of course, of course. And you're in the center, holding the Estreg, which is the heart. <coughs> of course it is. Every, every seven is like this. Why do we dance around seven times? <coughs> All sevens in the Torah like this. But, music. Let's take another example. Anything you like, a poem. A poem is made up of individual words. The words are meaningless. Have no effect on their own. You put the words together correctly, and it's much easier to put the words together <laughs> wrong than right. It's much easier to talk nonsense and be unpoetic than it is to write sublime poetry. But when you put the words together, something emerges that is cosmic in its beauty and its it's memor how memorable it is, both in its <coughs> cadence <coughs> and its musicality and its meaning. A great story. A great story is a sequence of events and details, and yet a great story or a great work of literature transcends the details. Transcends, and it's much easier to write something mediocre and meaningless than something great. But when the events tie together, with that sensitivity that a great piece of music or a great piece of poetry has, they tie it together in such a way that there's an effect. And the effect is the point. And it's the essence. And yet, you can't put your finger on it. You can't pluck it out of the system. In the seventh point in space, the six facets of the cube, six pieces of board, right, floating around in a pile. Now you construct them into the cube. Where's the seventh? Cube itself. But there's nothing there other than the six facets. But there is. It's the unity of, the, of all of them that makes the shape. Can you pluck it out? No. Nope. I can show you when it's there and I can show you when it's not there. But it's the point. It's the effect. And you only get the effect when the parts are fitting in perfectly. A great painting. How many examples do we need? A great painting. It's a lot easier to make a mess than a great painting, I can assure you. <laughs> a lot easier. But when the paint's put correctly on the canvas... When every lick of paint and every nuance and every brush stroke is perfect and you stand back. And sometimes when you look at the details from up close, meaningless. You stand back and they lock into something that is larger than the sum of the parts can be exquisite experience. Exquisite experience. Indeed, indeed, a good shir is like that too. A teacher, a talented teacher should be building a work of art. Indeed, any presentation, any presentation, a shir, a lecture, a secular presentation, it's a, it should be a work of art. It should sing. It, if you're a good teacher, your work should sing. A good teacher isn't simply presenting a list of details. A good teacher, by the way, should make you sing. A good teacher should present the material in such a way that the teacher is transparent. You see what's being taught. And then, if it's done well, you experience it. Music happens in you. A good teacher doesn't stuff material in. That's called indoctrination. A good teacher brings it out, brings it out, uh, awakens you to still you begin to sing, resonate with the material. Of course it's like that. Of course it's like that. Let's go a little further. Let's go a little further. Your marriage should be like that. A great friendship, a love between two people, a marriage, a friendship. It should be growing through the details and amounting to more than the sum of the parts. Here's two people been living together with each other for 50 years. Assume they're still together after 50 years and they, you know, they're not m mortally injuring each other if, every time they speak to each other. Good going. What's been built? A history. <clears throat> They've shared many things together. How many cups of tea did you make each other? <clears throat> How many favors? There should be more to it than that. A marriage should be a relationship that is building a unity that goes beyond the details. Far beyond the details. Inexpressibly beyond the details. There should be a, 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 a contribution, a sacrifice of self, right? a giving of self, that constructs something that is far greater than either one or the two of people together. Something far greater, infinitely greater, that you can't put your finger on. It's constructed by the details. Another act of consideration and kindness, another time when you bit your tongue and did not speak when you sh m might have wanted to, another moment of empathy, of genuinely feeling the other one's pain. 
another moment of empathic understanding of each other. Let's go one step further. There should be a marriage within the self. What is your life amounting to? What is your life amounting to? Another day of merely coping? Another day of going to work and earning a living? Another day of... What? Your inner being should be growing. You should be growing to the dimensions of a symphony. All the Torah you've studied, every aspect of Torah you've studied, every deep idea in Hasidus that has touched you and taken your breath away, every sugya in Torah, every demanding area of Torah study that, 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 that squeezes the mind to a new level of understanding, every moment of destruction of ego that achieves another level of humility, Every act of kindness that you did for someone else when you needed the time yourself and realized that you never lose through doing an act of kindness. You should be constructing a personality. In English, we might call it maturity. But I mean much more than that. And when a person grows intellectually, intellectually, let's, let's leave out for the moment character, intellectually, intellectual growth should yield a, a result that is greater than the finite. A person who is a professional in a field should reach a level of professionalism where they know with a certain professional intuition what's right, even before they, himself, they themselves have been able to calculate the reason. Absolutely. And I've seen great doctors at the top of their field. There's a certain intuition where they know a diagnosis, or they know whether something's serious or not, and even when they themselves, you say, but why is it like that? I used to say to my father, who was a wonderful specialist in his field, I used to say to him, how do you know it's that? You say, well, it looks like it. <laughs> elephant looks like an elephant. Okay, for the beginner, you've got to start, you know, putting the pieces together until you come to the conclusion. But for the expert, there's an intuition. <clears throat> can't fake that. You can't build that rapidly. That's a lifetime of experience. Rav Asaman used to say, what's Das Torah? Das Torah is when you, you go to a great rabbi for help with a Torah decision. Why, what are you going to ask him? Das Torah is not when you go and ask the rabbi something you should have been able to look up yourself. <coughs> that's not <coughs> that's not Das Torah. Das Torah is when you've looked it up yourself and you've reasoned it out for yourself and the decision is exactly 50-50. That's what you go to Das Torah for. And he'll tell you what to do. And Rav Asaman used to say, even when he himself cannot tell you why. But he spent 60 years seek, seeped, seeping, soaked, immersed in Torah. It seeped into his consciousness. He himself will know what the right decision is, even before he himself can break it down into analytical parts. That's the greatness. And you see it love deal in the secular world. Uh, secular world. In medicine, or in any professional field. That's maturity. That's professional expertise and maturity. Your inner being, your professional life, should be moving in that direction. Your personal life should be moving in that direction. If you're not growing in Torah, you learnt a bit more Torah, and a bit more, and another page, and another concept. But where's the music? Where's the music? There should be a construction of something that transcends the parts to an inexpressible degree. Otherwise, you're failing. Let me go one step further. That's the point. The point isn't this detail and that point. The point of a love relationship is the love. The point isn't this deed of kindness, and that deed of kindness, and the fact that you fulfilled your marital obligation in this fashion or that fashion. That's not the point. Those are the tools. The point is the love that's constructed. The point is the result. The point is not this note or the symphony or that note or the next note. That's not the point. The point is the effect that's built where the notes are done correctly. But it takes perfect attention to the notes. And it takes a consciousness, <coughs> intuition and awareness of the music. They both have to be felt at the same time. The musician does become the music. And as the musician becomes the music, every note is played perfectly. But, but at that level of expertise, every note has to be that way. It couldn't be different. It couldn't possibly be played wrong. And yet, when the notes are played in that fashion, with perfect attention to the notes and perfect attention to the music, something happens that far transcends them. In fact, so far that you don't even hear the notes. Counting the Omer. Jewish history, by the way, is building that too. When the end of history occurs and we enter a messianic phase, and every tragedy, and every Jew who was killed, and all the blood that was spilled, and all our moments of greatness, will fit into a cosmic symphony of history that will be beyond breathtaking. And then you'll see why each part was necessary. Why each part was necessary. Couldn't have done without it. 
in that blinding moment of revelation. That's what counting the Omer is. Counting the Omer is a counting where each day is finite. Let's, let's go through the questions we began with and see if we can answer them now. Let's see if we can do that. Why do we not count the first day? The first day is beyond count. The first day is Pesach. Hashem does that. That's the electric inspiration that comes from Him. Pesach means to leap over. According to Kabbalah and Pesach, you leap over 49 levels to the 50th. You leap over. God carries you to the 50th for free. can't count that. First day, that's Him. Why does He do that? To give you the inspiration, the charge, the amazing idealism that we can build this music. <clears throat> that we can play this music, <clears throat> that we can get there. You need to see what it is that you're capable of, who it is you're going to meet, who will be the marriage partner. So you can be struck with the romantic electricity. And then he says, get it, now do it yourself. And it's the second day, when the free gift is withdrawn, where you start counting the painful, no more, no more leaping over levels to the 50th. Level. Pesach means to leap over. You leap over and the first day you can have anything. You don't have to lock your door, no protection, nothing. It's divine night. It's a night that's not even a night. Man nishtana layla azeh means, why is this night different than others? Because this isn't even a night. This is a night that has the laws of a day. That's why the, the, the students of Rabbi Kiva couldn't tell that the morning had broken. Where they were, it was light already. This is why we say halal at night, which we never do. We do mitzvahs at night. This is a night that is a day. This is a night of total daytime illumination. <clears throat> but then, <clears throat> then you begin the counting. The finite steps. No free gifts of leaping over levels. That's why we don't count the first day. Why don't, why don't we count the last day? The last day is beyond count. The 50th day is not a day. The 50th day is the music. We count it by not counting it. We count the 50th day by not counting it. We count 49 steps and the 50th happens. <clears throat> if you counted the 50th day, you'd be making it one more step. The point of the 50th day is that it's the result that is beyond count. The 49 are the notes of the scale that are played. Played correctly, the music happens. The last thing you, you would think of doing on the night of Shuris is getting up and counting it's the 50th night. You mean you made it one more step on the ladder? One more step in the journey? This is not another step in the journey. This is destination. This is not another note that you add when all the notes have been played. This is the music. This is the totality, the coming together of all the notes. Of course you can't count that day. <clears throat> How do you get to God in this world? Through the finite steps of the world. Torah is a finite number of words. So many letters, so many words. Read correctly and constructed together. They're the mind of God. How do you know Hashem in the world? <clears throat> You leap out of the world someplace. You do it through the finite words of Torah. <clears throat> the finite actions of the mitzvahs. Finite actions of the mitzvahs. Every specific mitzvah with the right intention, bringing Torah into expression in the mitzvah. Every action in the world. So let's, let's see it again. Why didn't we count the first day? Not asked to count. Why did we count the last day? It's the result, not the number. Why do we count up and not down? You can't count down to something transcendent. You can't do that. You can't do the transcendence. You can't do the music. All you can do is add a note and add another note. So we count one day, two days of the Omer, three days of the Omer. Omer means to pile up. The Omer means a pile. Ma'amer is the work of piling a pile, building sheaves. The work of Ma'amer on Shabbos means to pile up and make an organized pile. We're counting the Omer. You can't count Shavuos. You can't do that. What an insult. What are you counting a relationship with God? You're giving it a measure? You're counting Torah? Can't do that. So we count the first day. Then we count two days. Then we count three. Now we've got three constructed. Now we've got four constructed. When you build a building, you can't build the building. You put bricks down. Not building the building. You're, building, you're putting the bricks. One brick. Now we've got two bricks. Now when you put the final brick on, you have the building. The beautiful construction is there. But you can't do the building. You can just do the bricks. So we count up, not down, because you can't count down to this. You can't build the result. The way you build the result, you can't build the final constructed personality. You can only do one more day of Torah study. One more day of self-privation and hunger and uh, prioritizing right, the spiritual effort over the material. Giving up an alternative career or an aspect of a career. Giving up the promise of material wealth. 
another time, and another time, and another time. Another forced hour of study. Another backbreaking seder in Gemara to get to that level and understand it deeply. Another aspect of annulling your ego in front of your Rebbe and being prepared to take that insult and show, be shown where your character's flawed. Another day of realizing that the world is here for much more than just coping. Another day of realizing and working on the fact that you're thinking too much about yourself instead of about somebody else and about... And when you do all that, something should emerge. There should be a maturity of personality that is tangible. If you're not different at the end of the year than you were before, materially different as a person, you're failing. You wasted a year. Every week should be like that, by the way. When you enter, enter Shabbos, Shabbos should be a celebration of what's been achieved that week, of how the parts have come together to form something that is of essence. And paradoxically and amazingly, although you can't do it, you can't do it, you can do the parts. But if you pay attention to the parts with greater and greater professionalism, the result takes place when you play those notes with total loyalty and total fidelity and do them correctly with an ear to the music, the music is heard. And therefore, counting the Omer, counting the Omer, counting from an animalistic level of undeveloped selfishness to the refined level of the spiritual, which is, which is called Torah. We build ourselves from a level where we are enslaved, unable to express ourselves, expressing the merest animal level of existence. And 49 days later, we entered the zone of the 50th, which is completely transcendent. Torah, relationship with Hashem Himself, <coughs> right? An unbelievable exhilaration. And how did you do it? By one step after another step, each one perhaps insignificant in its own right. Every brick, one more brick, one more brick, one more note in the symphony, meaningless, and yet essential. And when they're put together, something happens which is completely transcendent. The only way out of this world is through this world. The only way to Torah is through the Omer. You want to build a Yesh, 310 divine worlds that will be the essence of being Yesh. How do you do that? Omer. There are many other secrets here, <coughs> many other secrets to be, to be discussed, but that is the introduction to the theme of, the, of Tzemach Tzedek, at least one of the many themes that he built some money touching on tiny proportion of what he talks about. But this is a theme and I'm giving a bit of an expression to the deep ideas in Hasidus that he talks about. I'm just bringing out one of the themes that he hints at. But that is the meaning of Omer. To pile it up, you're piling it up, the result will happen. Of course it's an anticipation and a counting down, but your work is to put the pieces together correctly. Obviously there's a lot more to say here. Uh, I don't have time to go into the questions. I apologize for that. You're welcome to contact me, please. Um, but this is the basic idea. And therefore, thank you, Gemma, for making this happen in the background. Thanks to the JLE. Mitzvah Shem next week. We'll choose another mitzvah and see if we can <coughs> fathom something a little bit beneath the surface of the mitzvah so that when we take the blessing and count the Omer or whatever blessing it is and whichever mitzvah we do, we're a little bit aware, at least somewhat aware, of what lies behind the scenes. Wednesday, Mitzvah Shem, we have a series on 9, 9 o'clock UK time as well, Deeper Ideas of Judaism. And tomorrow night, Tuesday night at 9, just a one-off, I'm doing a little tutorial on viruses. If you're interested in viruses and their history, the great personalities, electron micrographs of what viruses look like, quite astounding, some of them, please feel free to join me through the JLE. And until then, have a wonderful week. Be healthy. Use isolation to build the parts of the soul until the music is heard. All the best.